Hey everyone, before we start today's story, I wanted to let you know a little something about the author Satterdead and this story, as well as two other stories of his that I've done in the past. There's a strange machine in the nursery and the sad sunflower. All of his stories take place in the same universe, so if you listen closely, you can pick up on the subtle clues in each story, seeing how they're connected. If you do, let me know down in the comments that you found a clue and how many. Don't put exactly what it is that you found, just put that you have found a clue. We don't want any spoilers. Now, I plan on doing more of his work in the future, so keep watching for when I do another of his stories, or, well, any other story that I do. Click the little bell so you don't miss a story. I try to get out at least three stories a week sometimes more if I'm able. Also hit the like and the subscribe button. I'm sure you've heard a million times about the YouTube algorithm, so I'm not going to get into all of that. Now, let's begin today's story. There used to be three of us. We were the only kids who lived on Lantern Street, by far the poorest neighborhood in town. That was a long time ago, and I haven't thought about it in ages. But a few weeks ago, something happened that just, well, it changed everything. But to get the full picture, we have to take a step back. Lantern Street originally had another name, but no one called it that. It was always just Lantern Street. It was the only street in town where they refused to fix the street lights. So instead, the locals put up solar powered lanterns. It had this dark, ominous feel to it. Some parents refused to let their kids play there, as it was on the far side of town and in a poor area. Still, kids interpreted this in the worst way possible. A dark street at the end of town where you're not supposed to go. Of course, there was something wrong with it. That's where we lived, me, Dawson, and Abby. Abby was the oldest and had four years on me. Dawson was about two years older than me. At that age, those numbers mean something. It was true. Our parents weren't well off, but we made do in our own way. We couldn't play any video games, and we had to use the computers at the library. But we didn't mind. We didn't know any other life. The three of us did pretty much everything together. I was an only child, but I always considered those two to be my brother and sister. We were the Lantern Street kids, and we stuck together no matter what. During Halloween, we had an ingenious idea. For one night, we took down all the lanterns so we could have a completely dark street. If kids wanted to pass from the north side of town to the west without crossing the highway, they had to pass by Lantern Street. We figured we'd make sort of a toll and really spook the place up. It was the only time where kids regularly passed by, after all. You see, we had this neighbor. He lived on his own with his two cats, and he had these strange paranoid delusions. For example, he only accepted mail if it was directly delivered to him by hand. He refused to drink tap water without boiling it. He covered all his windows in cardboard. But the strangest thing by far was that he thought the government was going through his garbage. His solution? To bury his trash in his backyard. It created this awful stench, and everyone living next to him had complained about it for years. But, just like the street lights, the city did nothing. This was our meal ticket. This creepy, paranoid nobody. We started spreading rumors around school. We started saying that he was chopping kids' heads off and burying them in garbage bags in his backyard. We even name-dropped some kids who moved out of town years prior, implying that 
they might have never made it out. We were trying to give Lantern Street a bit of a reputation so that when Halloween came around, we'd be there as brave protectors and guides for those who wanted to pass through safely. All it took was a few pieces of candy. That way, we could just stand around and do nothing and still get a ton of candy. It was brilliant. When Halloween rolled around, we'd dress up in cheap costumes that we made ourselves. All our parents were working night shifts. Abby was a pirate, Dawson was a ghost, and I was trying to be a gangster. But it was just my Sunday finest with a fancy hat. I had painted a mustache on my face with permanent marker. Big mistake. We'd taken down all the lanterns. Abby was placed up front to play up how scary the street was and letting people borrow handheld lanterns, which we'd just taken from around the street. Dawson was in the middle of the street, pretending to be a lookout and making sure it was safe to go through. He paused kids passing through sometimes just to play it up and asked them to hurry up when the strange man was on the move. I was at the end of the street to take the lanterns back and take our fair share of the candy as payment. Hell, we placed an old shovel on the sidewalk outside his house just to make a point. Sharp old thing, still. And I gotta say, it was flawless. Even the kids who had their parents in tow got in on it. It was this harmless, Halloween-y kind of thing to do. It was just stupid fun. No one really believed the stupid rumors about the guy kidnapping kids, so instead they just kind of went with it. We were the lookouts, and we were handsomely compensated. No one would be taken by the spooky man with the shovel tonight. I've never gotten more candy on Halloween than I did that year as lookout on Lantern Street. Eventually, we noticed we'd started something that we didn't completely control. Some kids got genuinely disturbed by the rumors, and even though the lanterns were put back up, some kids asked us to be lookouts long after Halloween was over. After all, our neighbor was often seen with a shovel in hand. It was pretty much the only time he went outside to bury his garbage bags. Whenever someone had to pass through Lennon Street, it wasn't unusual for them to ask us to watch their back. Hell, it was free candy and Pokemon cards. How could we say no? This influenced the street at large, though. Some parents were genuinely worried when they heard their kids talk about some strange man threatening to kidnap them. The rumors were like a death from a thousand cuts. Every new rumor or alleged sighting had an effect, and it came to the point where my parents told me to just stop talking about it. They rarely cared, no matter what I did. So, to have a serious talk with them usually meant someone had pressured them. Abby and Dawson had a similar experience. We agreed collectively that we would no longer provide lookout services, even if people asked us. But even though us lookouts tried to distance ourselves from the rumors, it was too late. Our neighbor was genuinely a strange man, but he wasn't dangerous. He just kept to himself a lot and didn't trust the government. That was enough for the rumors to take on a life of their own, which is why we knew there would be trouble when we saw a police cruiser parked outside his house. This was a man who genuinely distrusted the government officials and the police. There was no way he would cooperate or comply. He refused to let them in without a warrant, and he refused to talk to them. It all escalated to the point where, after three days of officers trying to reach a peaceful solution, they finally got their warrant. I have no idea how, 
but this is a small town. The results, he locked the doors, barricaded the windows, and refused to let anyone in. Four police cars were parked outside, and it was starting to look more and more like a siege. Everyone was looking out their windows, despite officers yelling at us to stay inside. I could hear every word shouted from a megaphone from my bedroom window. Finally, they broke the front door with some kind of sledge. I don't know why he did it, but the second the police entered the house, he fired at them. Someone got hit. He didn't stand a chance in an open firefight. It was over in seconds. I never heard a sound like that. Three houses away, I could still hear the screams, and I hid under my bed. I probably stayed there for half an hour, just waiting and holding my breath. I could still hear the gunshots echo down Lantern Street. Word got out that the rumors weren't true. Sure, he buried his garbage in the backyard, and there was a lot of strange things in his house, but nothing particularly illegal. No drugs, no bombs, no plans to kidnap innocent young children. It was just this paranoid shut-in, deluded into defending his home with a legally purchased weapon. It was chaos. No one wanted that property. It was tore down within a year. When the next Halloween came around, there were new rumors about Lantern Street. They spoke of a psychopath ghost, evil spirits, and a vengeful murderer. The fact that an odd but innocent man had been gunned down was not the story. Among the kids, he was still scary from beyond the grave. God, we were dumb. I thought a lot about it. Being responsible for someone's death just felt unreal. As a kid, it was difficult to even grasp. No one talked to us about it, checked if we were okay. There were no counselors for dirt poor Lantern Street kids, and Abby and Dawson, well, we just didn't talk about it. I think in a way that we tried to believe in our rumors. We tried believing in our own lies. In time, Lantern Street outgrew us, and even the lanterns themselves went away. There were new streetlights put up, and a convenience store was built on the empty lot. Rumors started growing more obscure, and over time the street was just known as the place where they shot that weirdo. But as the years passed, we left it behind. Abby moved when she got into Minnesota State, and Dawson moved cross-country to live with his long-distance girlfriend. And me? Well, I moved to Minneapolis to pursue a career in law enforcement. I guess I was inspired. That was my life until a couple of weeks ago. I was coming home from a long day of work. As I parked my car on the driveway, I noticed several street lights had gone dark. One more was flickering, about to go out. It brought my mind back to those days with Abby and Dawson being the lookouts on Lantern Street. I looked them up on social media, but I couldn't find any active accounts. Abby stopped posting about four years ago and Dawson stopped two years after that. I couldn't find out anything about them. It took me 45 minutes of intense googling before I found Abby's second account. On her final post, dated four years ago, people were commenting on how much they missed her. She was dead. I got this awful feeling in my stomach. I couldn't find anything about Dawson, but from the way people were commenting on his images, I got the feeling that something had happened, something people weren't too keen to talk about openly. As the clock crept closer to midnight, 
another light went dark outside. I was wide awake as I got in bed that night. For the first time in years, I slept with the lights on. It was just too dark outside. As I drifted off to sleep, there was a sudden pounding on my front door. I jumped out of bed as the sound stopped. It was so strange, I'd started thinking that I had imagined it. So unexpected. I put on a t-shirt and crept closer to the front door. No one in sight, but every light down the street had gone dark by now. And there, on the other side, I caught a glimpse of a pale light. A lantern, perhaps. This occupied my mind for a solid week. I waited for the street lights to be replaced, but no one ever came. It was history repeating itself. I'd looked up as much as I could about Abby and Dawson, but I couldn't find any specific details about their passing. The only thing I found, which might be the weirdest thing about it, was that they had both died on their birthday, the same year they turned 31. That got me thinking, and I dug a bit into the case of our old neighbor. Turns out he was 31 years old when his house was raided. That gave me the creeps seeing as my 31st birthday was coming up. I started noticing things. The streetlights were just the first thing. There had been holes popping up in the front yards around the neighborhood. When the garbage truck came around last Thursday, there were no garbage bags to pick up. They'd just collectively gone missing and causing much confusion. But the most telling thing by far was the solar-powered lantern I noticed hanging from a birch tree across the street. Every night, I anticipated pounding on my front door. I only heard it once, but once you start anticipating something, it's hard to relax. I'll be the first to admit I wasn't handling it well, and it felt silly to talk about it. It was all just superstition and coincidence, right? Sometimes, as i drift off to sleep, I'd get the feeling that someone was standing in my room. Someone showing themselves, just as I closed my eyes. Sometimes, i twist my head and spring my eyes open, hoping to see him. But he was never there. But as soon as I drifted off to sleep, I jolted back awake, expecting something to happen. Last Sunday, something did happen. I'd been to dinner with a friend of mine when I got back home, only to see my entire front yard covered in holes. A sturdy old shovel was leaning against my front door. At first, I was terrified, but it gave way to anger. I asked my neighbors about it, but no one had seen anything. Most had been out working. I didn't want this to intimidate me, but it did. Absolutely did. I'd just stand there, looking out my window, as if the holes in the yard would fill themselves in. There were more lanterns in the birch tree across the street. Some people had even started carrying them. And maybe I was imagining things, but I'd started seeing a few more stray cats than usual. And was that a blue sunflower growing next to my mailbox? That night, as I brushed my teeth before bed, there was another pounding at the front door. This time, I jumped to action. I brought my handgun with me as I ran. I pulled the door open only to see two faces I barely recognized. Dawson and Abby. They were my age, just standing there, holding one lantern each. In their other hand, they were holding some kind of fabric. 
It wasn't until much later that I realized it was their old Halloween costumes, a white sheet, a homemade pirate hat. They just stared at me with these blank, expressionless faces. They didn't blink. Dawson wasn't even looking directly at me. His head was sort of turned away. I didn't even notice I was aiming my handgun at them, and still I couldn't put it down. Something in me was screaming at me that this was a threat. I just couldn't tell how or why. Abby raised her lantern, giving me a better look. She had this long scar across her neck, jagged, nasty thing. With the lantern, she pushed her head into place. It was slowly sliding off her shoulders. She had been decapitated. I took a step back, forgetting how to breathe. They were just standing there, illuminated by this pale light. For a few seconds, I just looked at them, trying to make heads or tails of what I was seeing. Then they moved. Dawson was first. He stepped right on in, letting his head fall all the way off. It bounced off the stairs leading up to my front door with a meaty smack. He left his old costume behind, dropped the lantern, and just came at me with his arms outstretched. Abby stayed behind him. I was a breath away from firing when something turned my world upside down. Someone tripped me from behind, someone who was already in the house. He must have gotten in through the backyard. For a moment, I just laid there, looking up at the ceiling. I felt a foot pressing down on my hand as I dropped my pistol. A headless body came into view and the faint light of a solar lantern cast soft shadows over me. There were so many hands and feet, I still have trouble recounting how many they were. Your birthday is coming, Abby wheezed. Get your affairs in order. She didn't move her lips. She didn't move her eyes. And looking down at me, she had to use both hands to keep her head in place. Inches from my neck, a shovel slammed into the creaking floorboards. Someone pulled a bag over my head. It smelled like candy. I heard footsteps as they just left me there. I think there were three of them, all in all. It felt like that day when I'd hid under my bed as a kid, just waiting until it was all over. That was me, again, that night, just waiting, long after it was over. It must have been over an hour before I dared to move. I just curled up in a fetal position and cried. All I have to prove that they were even here is a shovel. I reported it as a home invasion, and I'm taking time off work. But there isn't much time. If the pattern holds up, something awful is going to happen to me, and I don't have the slightest idea how to handle it. I can't eat. I can't sleep. I keep dreaming. I can't breathe and sometimes wake up with this immense pressure on my neck. I don't know if this is all just nonsense. I don't know what will happen, but just in case I go away and stop responding, I want there to be some kind of record of what I've seen. And if you know Lantern Street, and if you know me, please try to do something, anything, for me, it's too late, but it might not be for others. I'm posting this not long before I turn 31. If I don't return, you know what happened. Look for the broken streetlights. Pay attention. Maybe visit a priest. I just hope I'm crazy. 
I pray that I am, but I don't think I am. <laughs> <laughs>